Hi guys, I've been analysing lots of different ransomware, bits of malware, um, obviously I'm in the final year of my university, so basically I've been doing my project dissertation and this has not really been easy, um, but nonetheless, the, the webcam may be a little bit buggy, like um, jaggedy on the, on the video and stuff, I apologise for that. I honestly have been just upskilling so much and doing different things. I've, I've recently looked at um, using GDB, the debugger, and Al using IDA in, in conjunction with that. It's been interesting, a learning curve indeed. Um, easy to use now for me. There's certain things that you don't get at the start while learning that you do eventually understand. So, um, yeah, I've been, been working on that. I've been working on a load of things. Uh, but the most interesting thing is this. At the moment, I thought I'd provide... Um, some form of video for you guys that was a little bit more than I've, I've previously done but still at the same time obviously I don't have mounds of time I'm still researching and doing quite a lot of different things so I thought I'd provide this anyway um, so th I'm gonna give a little preliminary this isn't like I've just smack bang got a unique ransomware sample um, I got this around the same time as everyone else so these articles were like a couple of hours ago like 24 hours 48 hours um, so Brad from, uh, I think Malware Traffic Analysis and Bleeping Computer did previously. Uh, as I said, had my own sample from uh, an email I'd set up, but it wasn't quick enough to publish. It happens sometimes in the security industry. Unbelievable. <laughs> um, good to work through the sample anyway and to deliver information about it and discuss. Um, even though someone's already done it, it's always good to get your take on it and stuff like that. So that's why I'm doing this. A little bit of history. I've been sent some some um, spam from these guys before um, because I, I sort of a couple of weeks ago I recognised the sort of similarity. So the top part, I've got my face in the way, like the last video. Um, so in the previous email, uh, we can see we've got USPS. And the user agent as well, which is basically the same. There is some, you know, if you were trying to put a statically set identifier, it wouldn't work. So you can see Mozilla 5.0, but then we've got this X11 here. Um, and this is using Linux. So we're both using Thunderbird, but different versions as well. This is the ransomware email. So this is the email. Um, fairly simple, quite identifiable as not good. Um, clicking the link led to a redirector, of course. A redirected page URI was set as a 404, sort of to look, make sure that, that intrusion detection systems were somewhat fooled in some way. I mean, probably not, because later on we got a HTTP transaction with an EXE. So anyway, um, word offline. So this is what we got redirected to. So this looks like um, word online, doesn't it? But it isn't. It's actually an image. Um, and they're not grabbing it from a, somewhere else or on the hacked web server, which it was. Um, it was a hacked web server. Um, it was using Base64 in its images, and this is how it was trying to coax people into downloading it. So it had Word Online, but it was saying, as you can see on the image, that it can't be read and you need a plugin. And so most people would be like, let's give it a go. Um, hosted on Google Docs, removed and obviously saying it's infected, but... Um, yeah, Google Docs, so people might have thought, hmm, sort of makes sense. It was MFC that was used. If anyone is in reverse engineering and discovers what I am, what, 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 I, what I saw, um, I saw things that I didn't want to see, that's all I'm saying. I didn't really enjoy it. Um, I also want to talk about how the icon was set as a PDF. Um, that kind of, that, you know, if you clicked on the download and then you see the, the icon, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Wasn't signed with anything like that. Um, fairly small stub size for what, what it actually was. Although, extracting it out, it was, I don't know. It was, I used dynamic analysis for this. I, I feel like a lot of people think it's a dirty thing to do. Like, you, you should be able to do it in static analysis. And I get that, I get that, but... I did, I did, you know, what some people would say cheat a little bit. I didn't. That's You should be doing this. Um, but it means that you sort of lose understanding of how it initially happened. Um, now, the problem is, is that other samples that people got ran in the sandbox. So they were able to see drop files and everything like that. My MFC sample um, did not. You can see the MD5 of the trial one there. 
I forgot to actually include them in so that you can, you know, do it yourself. But they are, I have uploaded them publicly to Hybrid Analysis and I think malware. They should be on Virus Total anyway. Um, so you could just grab them hashes and have a little look. Um, but that initial sample did not return with uh, understanding what it what it um, executed, which was ransomware. Um, it did not lead to that whatsoever. Um, so I went into memory, of course, and looked for RWX, and we have an MZ right there. I say MZ, executable. Yeah, after running that and suspending, I find something, that's what it is. How fantastic is that? So then we move on to the actual ransomware sample. We can, I, uh, you know, I, it was pretty darn obvious within a couple of seconds after loading it into either that it was, you know, not packed or, in, you know, uh, obfuscated in any way. This was a really simple, easy to analyze um, piece of kit, really. Um, to do in IDA, so nothing huge. I didn't even use the pseudocode uh, functionality in IDA. Persistence was pretty generic, um, but I use it quite often. They open it and check. So in the first point, the very first thing we do is actually we set a value in the current version run, which is um, basically where where we at. You know, where, where we at at the moment. Um, after registry startup attempt, we check to see if that actually worked, and we do have. Uh, so we've got two functions there. Jack doesn't really rename his subroutine sometimes, so hate me. Um, then we test, check, um, if if we don't, and just let's move on to something else, basically. Um, I'm not fully sure, I can't remember now if it goes straight to encryption or it, it um, goes into another routine looking at something. It's like it, it checks registry again afterwards. Anyway, so... Uh, we use get version, nothing huge to compare and look at our version to understand if we can do what we're about to say, which is do a little bit of UAC. We want to see if UAC is about in these versions, right? So after we've done a bit of comparisons, we want to then check, um, well, no, we want to send a message box saying display color calibration isn't really working, access denied. And what we're trying to do here, and uh, if you go on the bleeping computer uh, articles or the Brad article, right, where... Uh, they have images of it. Is that it's um, basically it's called mole ransomware. So you can put that out. Um, you'll see that they display a message box trying to get people to accept the UAC prompt that they give. Um, so we use that using WMIC process call create. Uh, the executable is held within the executable that is used as ransomware. Like it's, it's executed from app data and all real um, things that we need, like the public key. And the instructions are also held in app data. No folder, just app data. Uh, and we use shell execute as well. So, you know, nothing out of the out of the world. And that's why I'm sort of introducing this. Because it's sort of a generic introduction to all ransomware. Because there's a lot of features that we have from various places that will include this. I'm not saying that every specific case that I've put in here is in ransomware. Like, you know, this, this, this. I'm just saying that in, in a general scheme of things, a lot of this stuff will be in other pieces. I mean, obviously it will because they're lazy. Um, so now we do an integrity check to see whether we are high integrity and we can do what we want to do. So we've sent a USC. Now we're checking the integrity to make sure that USC has been accepted and everything and our process can do this. So uh, this is actually quite often with a lot of... Um, I think I actually talked about this in the another analysis video that I did. But anyway, so as we can see, I'm just sort of highlighting this because this sometimes gets people a little bit confused, but we've got the EAX in... Well, the, the address of EAX into EDI, and then moving EDI to EAX, um, and then we're popping this. This is the same subroutine, and then we're moving on. This is different, so it is priv integrity is what this is. Um, and then we are comparing EAX with 3000, which is high integrity. Um, and you can see more. Oh, look at that. That's right in the way. That's annoying. Can we click out the way for that? That's not cool. Dropbox, do one. Hey, there we go. There you go. There's the URL. Just need to learn how to use Dropbox, really, don't I? So if it's high integrity, then we execute a load of different commands. And one of the most common things here that we have is the deleting of shadow copies. Um, that's quite common. Um, some other bits here, a little bit spicy. Um, you know, I see a lot of PowerShell usage, which this didn't, but I'm, I'm putting that out there as well. I see a lot of PowerShell cert util as well. And then we are, we're creating a GUID. Now we need that so we can specifically identify ourselves. And I'm just showing it there. 
Uh, that's how, the process name is actually, as I can say, say here, we actually use co-create GUID as well. Um, for that, I've just noticed. I've, I've noticed the title that we use co-create. Uh, well, we use the GUID for the process request as well. I'm not making any sense for the HTTP transaction um, for the public key. So we set a GUID, we truncate it to the first part, where well, there's a dash, right? And we, we put that as a process name, and then we also use it as our identifier. Um, we'll see in a bit. There it is. So there's our GUID. Um, we use that. Um, we actually only use two HTTP transactions within this. So we use it, one, to send for our public key. And then we use it again. If you don't know cryptography fundamentals, then search up public key encryption. Um, and also the v ver, which is the obviously the operating system version. And then we also have this argument here, um, comparing, which basically if, if we have a certain... Uh, value set so one we want to say file count and that'll be used later but at the moment we're not using file count we'll be setting uh trying to get the response for the public key and there we go and then we send it into a statically set file and then we got the extension dot mole uh, which is you know pretty interesting to be honest uh like yeah um we the this is the the higher level of it so this is the actual request here um, I don't obviously name all the subroutines because it was fast, but anyway. Uh, sent to an IP in France from a Russian provider, normal. Super subs is a JS file, it is after a JS file. What I'm trying to say is the super subs.js and they were trying to make it normal by saying super subs.php. Uh, I'm not trying very hard to look normal though because some ransomware, some ransomware URIs have stuff like that which make it look a little bit less dodgy. Um, Use generic root for read the public key, nothing major out of that. I'll just show you there's, that's what it is. <laughs> um, and then we start with the directory enumeration. Now this is where I got a little bit crazy because I thought about looking at this a little bit more intensely, but then I was like, I can't do this. Um, so, you know, I might look at it later, but, you know, from what I could see, I was looking at the character extensions and how it was looking at the directories. It wasn't actually had a preset extension list. It was doing it in a different way. But I went into a subroutine and I had a jump table with over a thousand nodes and I was like, I'm out. Um, so, you know, I'll maybe have a look at that later, but it's not a huge thing in this. Decent filtering on files, including making sure you don't encrypt uh, the instructions, which is the most important part of this. Some ransomware that's less good doesn't really think about that. Um, so it's, that's what we've got at the bottom there. So the start of encryption, what we're doing is sort of the same what I've talked about, just generic read and write. Uh, allocate some memory space for the file to contents to be read, and then it gets tick count. Now, with tick count, sometimes ransomware uses it as a seed value. From what I could see, you know, it looked like it was using it as an anti-debug. It was comparing it and then going into a function which didn't really look that good, or it looked a little bit nonsensical. So I left it at that, but can't 100% confirm. What I noticed is that in the MVC initial application, there was an int, int 3, so I'm sort of thinking there's sort of generic, not that harsh, there was a set unhandled exception filter in one of the, the I can't remember if it was the um, initial sample or, but um, yeah, they didn't try too hard, stack analysis makes it easy for me to just have a look at stuff, um, do not, as I say, do not see it being used as a seed value. So, um, encrypted file handle is created before we actually do the original encryption. We, we encrypt the original file. So we create another file handle which will have hex values dot mole um, and then we delete the file. So we don't actually read the file and then just write it in. We create a new file with the name uh, and, and the, the name from the file that we're getting, right? Making sense? Not sure. Uh, dot mole and then we encrypt the file that we want, the original file from the handle, uh, the original file handle. Then we put the contents into our new file and then we close all the handles, all, all good, right? And then we just delete the file. So interesting. Um, nothing too interesting on the encryption side really, RSA uh, implementation, using standard Windows API. Chooses to have null set on a crypto service provider, sort of interesting, and rely on Windows to find it from a provide 
To find it from provider type. Blimey. DW provider type set to one RSA underscore full. As I say, we delete the original file. Pray for slack space, right? For the, the victim. Then move instructions on how to get files back. This is done in every directory. I say this now. I should have probably put that below. Find next file, basically. So we're just iterating through the files. And you'll see in handles from the process, there's like this. I'm doing this. But there's like a staircase, isn't it? It's um, recursively going through directories. Um, and then going through the files. And then if it finds it interesting, it'll encrypt it. We then send our final HTTP request with the final count of files that we've encrypted. We show instructions in notepads. Nothing too extraordinary from this ransomware. It actually just outlines an email that you should send uh, to for, for some help. Um, ransomware, as I say, fairly quiet and actually does not have any fancy HTML. Just a TXT with some instructions. As we can see here, um, the, the instructions are actually set in the... Bar well, of course they are. Uh, no sort of use of Tor or anything like that, so interesting. Thanks for watching. Uh, hopefully that was fairly interesting. Um, I made, may have made mistakes in the analysis or, you know, on the slides. There was a few grammar mistakes I made, you know, but I've got to roll with it. Uh, please comment in the video if I had in the on the comment section, not in the video. You can't do that. Um, so thank you very much. There's a there's a mistake. You could, you could put that down below, but that would be a bit mean. Anyway, so thank you for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.